Civic Shoulders, the show where we get advice from Chicago's leaders in the civic space and in our data ecosystem. And today I have with me Damon Drummer. Uh, Damon's bio sort of reads like a community organizer's dream. Uh, he's had a very rich career here in Chicago. He has been associated with Chicago's open government movement for about as long as there has been a movement. He's been a fellow with the New Organizing Institute. Um, he took a break for a while to be a field organizer for the Obama right. campaign, and now he's a tech organizer for TeamWorks Inglewood. Welcome. So happy to be here. I was so happy to have you here. Tell me a little bit about Teamwork Inglewood, uh, Damon. So Teamwork Inglewood is about a 10-year, well, we just hit 11 years old. Is that right? So we're an 11-year-old uh, community-based organization that works with local leaders to improve the quality of life in the Inglewood neighborhood. Uh, our catchment area, as it were, is uh, Inglewood, West Inglewood, and a little piece of the Greater Grand Crossing neighborhood. Oh, that's terrific. And that there's there were there has been a lot of... Uh, smaller organizations in Inglewood, smaller community organizations, and you support all of them? You sort of are an umbrella for them? Yes, yeah, so we work as a partner. Uh, I guess umbrella would be uh, a, a, not, not the term that we would use, mm -hmm. but uh, we're definitely a partner. The whole premise of Teamwork Inglewood is built on the idea that uh, the philanthropic community, uh, government agencies, and other partners outside of our neighborhood need a consistent partner to work with who can then triage and coordinate and be sort of a, a switchboard for resources and coordination for uh, investing in the neighborhood. And that's what Teamwork Inglewood is there to do. And one of the things that, I, that strikes me as something unique to Teamwork Inglewood is that you had this quality of life plan that was driving a lot of your activities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the quality of life plan uh, is actually is part of the DNA of our organization. It was this uh, planning moment where it was funded by List Chicago and uh, the MacArthur Foundation. And the idea was, before we establish an organization, or as we establish this new organization, how do we anchor it into the desires of the community? How do we make sure that it is doing what the community wants it to do? And how is it positioned to coordinate and convene folks in the neighborhood to move toward a shared vision? So the Quality of Life Plan hits about 12 different points. Uh, one of them was this idea of a central clearinghouse, a hub of information for community resources. And out of that point, our Inglewood Portal uh, idea and concept came out. Inglewoodportal.org is a uh, community-based website where folks in the Inglewood community can share our own stories so that the narrative is not dominated by ABC7 and NBC. It is, you can tell the story. You can create the story. That's right. And that's interesting uh, because that... It, that takes civic tech and really puts the civic into it, right? That's right. That's right. right. The, the idea is that uh, we can use technology as uh, pretty much we're learning that technology threads the needle on all 12 of those strategies in our quality of life plan. If technology is not in the mix, uh, the Inglewood neighborhood now knows that we need to pull somebody in and get it in the mix. And another um, element where technology is running through it is the Inglewood Codes project. Tell me a little bit about that. So the Inglewood uh, Code story is uh, some of the work that I'm most excited about in Inglewood. Uh, all of Inglewood embraces it, uh, but it builds on, uh, at that point, three years of technology investment in the neighborhood. It started with the uh, Smart Chicago, uh, the Smart Communities Program here in Chicago. The city of Chicago uh, looked up one day and noticed that there were several neighborhoods in our city where uh, home broadband internet adoption was extremely low. And uh, the city decided to do something about that. And so we took some federal recovery dollars, invested it in five neighborhoods and uh, to see if we could craft a, 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 a collection of programs and strategies that would increase home broadband internet adoption. So we reached out to small businesses. We reached out to youth and families, parents and job seekers, and did basic digital literacy skills. We had the Inglewood portal. Uh, we had small business uh, resources. Uh, getting small businesses um, the ability to have internet in their establishments and to take credit cards because they were losing out on sales. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things that we, we take for granted in different parts of the, uh, of the city were not the case in Inglewood. So we did that for about three years. And two years into that, actually a full year into that project, we decided to focus on youth. We were teaching a lot of seniors and job seekers basic internet, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, things like that. And that was really cool for them. But how do we work with the youth who already know what Facebook is, who already have email? And we decided to teach our young people how to code because we believe that the best way for Chicago to stay competitive is to build a broad base of deep tech talent throughout every neighborhood. 
So that's what Angular Codes is all about. And so you're baking, uh, you're baking coding into their basically into their DNA while they're young, so that's that right. they can participate in the new economy, which won't be so new anymore exactly. by the time they're ready to enter the workforce. Exactly. Uh, and this idea that we can take students who didn't even know what code was, we asked a simple idea at them. We said. Do you want to learn how to build your own website? That's all. That, that's the question we asked. We had 120 applicants, uh, and uh, we had 25 slots. And we took those 25 students, and we asked them before we started one day of programming, are you interested in pursuing a career in technology? And 72% uh, said, um, actually 80% said no. Really? They hit the uh, no button? That's it. Uh, Unbelievable. Only 20% of our students uh, were interested in pursuing a career in tech. After our 10-week Ingle Codes program, 72% yeah. were saying, yes, I am interested in pursuing a career in tech. Not that they would, but it was an option that they were considering. Right. Uh, that's the metric that we're most proud of. And it gives them, uh, it gives them another, another piece of the world view, again, so that they can participate in the economy. And so, again, the Inglewood Codes project was an organizing effort. You know, it was all about technology, but it was right. also all about community. We used Kickstarter in partnership with the mayor's office and World Business Chicago to launch our fundraising uh, campaign. Uh, we raised our first $1,000 in Inglewood. Oh, uh, is that right? It was important for us to start our fundraising campaign at home uh, to demonstrate that Inglewood does have a role to play in its own development. Right. And then, I mean, literally, when you start reaching out, you have about 20% of our $5,000 goal hit, and we haven't even started asking yet. That was important, too, strategically. But in the Inglewood neighborhood, Inglewood Codes is part of the neighborhood's narrative. It was something that Inglewood wanted for itself. And so we're really proud about how we did that. So we reached out to all the block club leaders and everybody that we knew who had a credit card <laughs> or a debit card and, uh, and reached out to them first before we reached out to our friends in the tech community. It's so it's so valuable, so important because it demonstrates that there is local commitment and local investment in the project. That's, That's terrific. Right. That's right. One thing that Inglewood, Timor Inglewood, is careful to do is ensuring that we don't get out too far ahead of our resident leaders and, and, and our constituency. We want to move with our community, not on behalf of or for our neighborhood. Oh, that once again putting the civic in the civic tax. That's right. Okay, terrific. Recently, um, you had a very highly acclaimed. Um, session at the Code for America Summit. The Code for America Summit is a once a year convening of the civic tech community in the United States and as of recently a little bit beyond the US. Uh, but you talked quite a bit about largelots.org and now a lot of people uh, are talking about your okay. session. So uh, it happens to be my favorite example of civic tech in Chicago. Tell us a little bit about Large Lots. Well, one, we appreciate the blog post you wrote. You're uh, very it welcome. blew up in the neighborhood. The Resident Association was posting it. It was great. It was heartfelt. <laughs> it was It was amazing. Uh, the Large Lot story starts back in 2011, right around the time the Smart Community story uh, began, which is pretty interesting for us. And it started out as a simple land use plan. Uh, the List Chicago, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, and the City of Chicago came together to address the, uh, the fact that there were 2,000 vacant lots, city-owned vacant lots, in the Inglewood community alone. 2,000 lots sitting on the city's books. On the city's books. Not to mention the ones in private hands, right? We think there are as many of those. So the City of Chicago has 2,000 city-owned lots in the Inglewood community alone. And uh, there are a number of residents and block clubs who have uh, come together to repurpose these lots to not be an eyesore on the block, but to help beautify and create a sense of place. And when you say it's city-owned, they are literally on the city's books. Yes. Okay. So this is property owned by the city. And, you know, the city is not in the property management business, uh, right. particularly the vacant lot management business. And so the ideal is to get these back into private hands. And so the policy to do that currently is the adjacent neighbor land acquisition program. The idea is that you can purchase a lot on either side of your home next door. Uh, the problem was that there were many people who lived across the street from, from a vacant lot or there was a vacant lot next door to somebody, um, to a home that was not owned by a homeowner, but owned right. by a property management company. So they weren't eligible to purchase that lot because you had to live in the home. So residents during this land use planning process came together and said, we need to find a way to make a more flexible version of ANLAP that fits the needs of our neighborhood. You know, the, the majority of uh, uh, property in the neighborhood isn't owned by residents, so we need a better way to get these lots into resident hands. And so that was the large lot program. The idea was as long as the lot is on your block, and so long as, um, <clears throat> and as, long as you don't apply for more than two lots, uh, as long as you don't sell a lot in five years, you can purchase this lot from the city, not for $1,000, but for $1. 
So for one dollar, not one dollar plus the back taxes, for one dollar. One dollar taxes cleared. And they put those restrictions around uh, around the limited number that you can purchase, so as to avoid uh, shady prospectors and That's folks right. like that. And, and 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 like private land banking. That's for Cook County to do, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and and the the idea is to make sure that the that the residents are participating in this program. Again, residents invested in their neighborhoods. That's right. So there were a number a number of residents who lived on one block but owned property halfway across the neighborhood in the same community. So their commitment to the Inglewood was very clear. Uh, but they wanted to purchase property next door across the street from that building that they owned, you know, on Racine or something like that. There were also people who did not live in the neighborhood but owned property in the neighborhood for, for, you know, for a period of time who were also eligible to purchase these lots. Again, those who had invested in Inglewood had the opportunity to double down on that investment and allow these lots not to be a detriment to their investment but an enhancer. Now, how do they keep you from purchasing that lot and keeping that lot empty the way it is? What are the restrict? What are the rules around that? So you have to gate it. You have to put a fence around it. It has to be a non-combustible fence, which means it can't be wood. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, you're 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 liable, and you have to comply with all the rules of vacant lots in the city. So it can't be trash. It can't be you know garbage and weeds overgrown onto the sidewalk and things like that. So the the rules are pretty tight, and you have to pay the taxes. So it's not a it's not a freebie by any means. It is a, a very strict regime that folks are signing up for. The tax is going forward. You have the tax is going yeah. forward. Yes, and so you know. Folks who had concerns about that, we were very clear at Teamwork, you know, maybe this program isn't for you, you know. If you're concerned about getting a citation from the city for not putting a fence up or can't afford a fence, you know, these are literally this opportunity to, for people who have the means and the willingness to take hold of one of these lots and make sure it's not an eyesore on the block anymore. So Teamwork it seems like it played a, a, a critical role in a few different dynamics. Number one, you were ensuring that your residents were participating in the democratic process around policy in their own neighborhood, but also giving them guidance to even outside of policy to make sure that it fell into line with the goals of the program. That's right. And one thing, there, there's, a, there's a hero in the story. It's the Resident Association of Greater England. I'm one of the co-founders. Rage. Uh, Rage. Uh, I always say Resident Association. But it is Rage. That's what we call it. And uh, Rage was the primary architect, along with the city of Chicago, with the large lot program. And I, in that case, Rage knew what it wanted. It was convening residents around this one issue. You know. The, 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 uh, the land use plan had several points, and so teamwork was like involved in all of those. And Rage focused in on this one part and really went the full mile, the full measure of effort, and got this policy uh, adopted by the city. And our job as teamwork was to back them up. Whenever they were in the room, we would ask the question, right after they asked it, hey, what's going on with large lots? Or if they weren't in the room, we would ask the city, what's going on with large lots? Right. So in that case, we would back them up, and other groups would guide them and make sure their voice was heard as well. And so we were, again, the convener. We brought everybody to the table and made sure that all the voices were heard. Now, there was, this is civic tech, so there was a tech component to There this. was a tech Tell component. us about largelots.org. So in, on March 20th, when the large lot plan was passed by the, uh, was it the Chicago Plan Commission, Burnham's own committee, right? right. Uh, the Chicago Plan Commission passed our Green Healthy Neighborhoods Land Use Plan with that, the large lots recommendation. The city was given authorization to do a pilot program in the greater Inglewood area uh, for this dollar lot program, and so it went up, and literally that night, uh, one of the um, one of our friends in the civic uh, tech space, uh, Juan Pablo Velez, he's no longer uh, in Chicago; he's in New York, actually. He hit me up via G Chat. Literally, Adam, I walked from City Hall to Harold Washington Library to to charge my phone, <laughs> and I get this G Chat from uh, Juan Pablo, and he says, "Hey, what are you going to do about this new policy? You should build something to track applications or something like that." I'm like. Oh, I gotta get my head around this, right? right. We're still catching our breath from this whole process. We talked that night, and out of our conversation, it became very clear as he sent me the link to the city website. I'm like, if we just redesigned this policy webpage, if we just redesigned the site that residents would go to to figure out if they want to apply or not, and made it very simple to see if a lot was available on their block, we'd be doing a tremendous amount of work, you know? Tracking all that aside, right, if we just did those basic things, we'd be doing a great, a, a great service for the neighborhood. And that's what we did. Uh, we tapped some resources at LISC Chicago and uh, hired Data Made to build largelots.org with us. 
So that was really exciting. And this is about, and then about two weeks in, we were able to release the, uh, the app. And so this is another benefit of Civic Tech. Not only does it, you know, people think Civic Tech, they think building apps. It's also about simplifying processes. So this takes a process that was once cumbersome that required you looking at through possibly multiple uh, multiple maps from multiple departments and zones, etc. And it gives you one place to look at it and track it. And uh, it's, like I said, Code for America Summit, this was the hit of the summit. Oh, so. that's, that's, uh, there were a lot of great presentations, but we were proud to tell the Chicago story of civic innovation right in Inglewood. I, th I think it's the case example of what can happen at the neighborhood level when a community takes technology seriously and is organized as well. And I th you mentioned Daniel Burnham. I think he would be very pleased with the way this has all turned out. Cool. Demond, thank you very much thank for, for being on the show. This has been Big Shoulders. Thank you.